Happy Mother's Day, mothers out there. It is, you know, we're blessed, uh, blessed church to have amazing mothers in this house today. And I am uh, honored to just uh, be able to stand up here and represent you ladies this morning in a way uh, to kind of reflect back on the gift of motherhood to each of us. We've all been impacted by mothers, haven't we? You know, um, in, in so many different ways. And um, I'm so grateful. I'm definitely a, a man who has been influenced by great mothers in my life. And uh, I'm so thankful for it. I've had great grandmothers, great moms. And um, I think that sort of kind of impacted me at a young age because all through life I've kind of gravitated in that direction. I really felt like I always connected really well with moms because of probably the legacy of my mom pouring into my life uh, at a, an impressionable age. So thank you moms for being moms. I'll tell you what, sometimes I think we underestimate the power of the influence of a mom. I really think we do. I think that the enemy is very aware of the influence of the family and especially the mothers and how they impact and how they sow into the future generations. And we got to be aware of that and, uh, you know, and honor that position and honor uh, that calling that God has on moms. It is a calling. Do you guys realize that? That just being a mom and, and, and serving Jesus in your homes is, is a high calling. Amen? Sometimes we think it, you know, you have to be a pastor or you have to have a reverend or you have to be a worship leader. Or you have to be those things to serve Jesus and to, to, to uh, leave an impact upon society. And the truth is that is not true. The truth is, is when we read the Bible, we see God using the simple things to confound the wise and to literally shift culture through some of the seeds that were sown through simple acts of kindness. And many times we'll see it even through the act within the family dynamics. And, um, and uh, so it's my honor today to just break for a moment and to look at those things. In the house of the Lord, look, if we turn to Ephesians 6, Ephesians 6, verse 1 and 2 says, Obey your parents in the Lord. So this is saying, it's speaking to the children. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. Honor your fathers and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise that it might go well with you and you might live a long life in this earth. So do you think it's important to God to, to break and honor mothers? I do. I do absolutely believe so. So... Um, I believe that motherhood, I, I believe that fatherhood is a, is a high calling on uh, those lives. And the thing is, guys, is this. You might say, well, I'm not a mom or a dad. Well, you can serve at that capacity. You can serve at that capacity. Amen? And if you're kind of the youth growing up, God is staging you already at a very young age to, to serve at that capacity in, in, in later years. So, so please pay attention to, to what uh, the Lord is speaking today. So I want to jump right into something right now. Is, is, as we kind of did this, the title of my message today is called Sowing Seeds of Influence, or Seeds of Influence. And so we have this, ladies, we're going to give these out to you at the end of the service, um, that the youth and some of the people of the church, Pastor Jim and myself and Jason and CJ, we're all part of, of and Xavier, we're building this this week. Um, but I want you guys to realize um, that there is so much impact and so much influence we have on our children today. And we're going to examine, we're going to look at three biblical examples of that in the Bible where a mom Literally, God used a mother to shift a nation and to shift a culture. It's powerful. It's super powerful. 
I was going to kind of go into an introductory, but I don't think I have time. I'm just going to dive right into the message. So we're not going to prime the pump this morning. We're going to, we're going to go right into it. And uh, we're going to talk about these three women of the Bible that left a legacy behind through the seeds they sown into their child that changed and shifted the movement of, of history, really, in reality, and God records it in the Bible. The three, I'm going to start with the first one. The first one is Hannah. Now, how many of you guys know the story of Hannah? Yeah? Do you, so Hannah was a, a, a woman, a Jewish woman, that was married to Elkanah, and she was, she was barren. And it literally says in the Word of God that, that her barrenness was, was something that the Lord allowed to happen. You say, wait a minute, that don't sound right, right? Does God allow us to go through testings at times? Yeah, he does, right? God was doing something in Hannah's life to prepare her to do something extraordinary. Sometimes, like, when we go through something very difficult, that is the staging ground, that is the birthing ground where God is developing character within us to be able to do something more extraordinary um, than we would if we didn't walk through that. So God was preparing Hannah to do something that would, um, that he would use her to, to literally bring the nation of Israel back to himself. But he needed Hannah's character, character to be prepared for this calling. So she's barren, and it literally says that she had, um, I forget what the, the word says it, but basically one that would just um, constantly harass her. It was Elkanah's other wife, and I'm, you know, so, and she would harass her and, and pick on her and torment her. The word would be torment her because of her barrenness. And through this process of time, Hannah just got to be the point where she was struck with grief. And to the point where Elkanah noticed it, and when Elkanah noticed, her husband noticed this grief on Hannah's life, he goes to her and he says, babe, babe. Now, guys, grab a hold of this. I'm going to help us out. You know, when, when, when our wives are going through something, this is something you don't do, all right? <laughs> Put this in your pocket. You don't do this. He's like, babe. He's like, why are you so sad? You got me, honey. I'm worth <laughs> 10 sons, right? He's like, man, I, I am, I'm everything that you ever need and more, right? Oh my gosh, can you, that is, there's no humility in that at all. And, and, and Hannah feels misunderstood, like, come on. Like, how many of you ladies at times have felt misunderstood by your man? Don't, don't raise your hands, all right? <laughs> but sometimes we can be lousy comforters. You know, that's a gift that God has given both men and women, but women seem to have a, a, a easier, um, a, a, an easier way of doing it, or, or, or more natural, or they're inclined to do that. And so, so Elkane is like, you know, honey, you know, like you got me, that's all, just focus on me, we'll be, everything will be fine. And, and he's just misunderstanding Hannah's heart, because her heart knows that she's been created for something unique. She knows that there's a calling on her life, and she wants to use that calling in a way to serve God. So, she, so they go to, to um, Shiloh. This is where they would worship. And she goes um, before the priest, and she's in the tabernacle, and she's worshiping the Lord, and she's pouring her heart out to the Lord and just crying out to him and weeping and, 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 and speaking to the Lord. And she makes a vow to the Lord, and she says to the Lord, Look, if, if, if you just give me, and she's specific, which I, I don't know if Carrie's in the room, but thank you, Carrie, for sharing that. But she's specific with request. She just doesn't ask for a child. She asks for a son. And there's a reason why she asks for a son, because she knows if she's given a, a, a firstborn son, that she can give him back to the Lord, that he would be able to serve the Lord. 
for all the days of his life. So she says, give, if you give me a son, Lord, if you remove this shame from me and you give me a son, I will lend him back to you and he will serve you all the days of his life. And then she also gives a Nazarite vow that says no razor will touch his head just to symbolize that he is set apart for the work of the ministry. And the Lord... And the Lord Lord's hears her cry, but listen what happens here. And this is amazing. Is she's still misunderstood because here's the high priest, Eli. He sees her weeping and making this commotion in the tabernacle. And he goes before her and he says, you know, get out of here, you drunk woman. You know, that's basically what he says to her. He says, you know, put away your fermented drink. Like, put it away. This is not the place or the time to be drunk and he says you got you know he's basically shaming her in, in that moment she's like no no you don't understand she's like I'm pouring my heart my heart out to the Lord no one else understands my heart my yearning what I desire to do she's like I want to to have a child but I'm barren you see but if the Lord gives me a child I'm gonna to to lend him I'm gonna I'm gonna turn him over for service onto the king of kings and Eli hears this request and he says, you know what? Go in peace. The Lord will, will grant your request. And so she goes, and this is, this is amazing. This is amazing. It says, um, Eli says in verse 18, so we're in 1 Samuel, and it's, it's verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 18. It says, let your maidservant find favor in the sight, in your sight, so that that woman went out her way, ate, and her face was no longer sad. She received that word from the high priest in faith. And that's why I love the songs today. It was just such a reminder that God is a covenant-keeping God, that he is true to his word. And when we take his word and we mix faith with it, God moves powerfully in the lives of his children. But it's important that we apply faith. Sometimes we hear God's word and it's kind of like, it's kind of like well-wishing where we like, okay, God, I hear the promise of God and I really hope that it comes to fruition in my life. But we don't, we don't apply, we don't mix faith in on it. And, and there's such a power when we take God's word and we apply the measure of faith God has placed within us and say, you know what, God, I don't understand everything, but I'm going to trust you in this moment. Because it even says that when Hannah leaves the tabernacle and she goes back home with Elkanah, that, that right away it doesn't happen. But in, in the process of time, she has a child and she names him Samuel. Now, what can we pull out of this story? And I want to share with you just I'm, I, one simple truth that, that, is, is, that is profound, and we'll get to that, but it, we see this common truth happening in the, these three women that I'm going to share today. First of all, what Hannah does is extreme. It's absolutely extreme. We can say, well, oh, that was easy, right? She made a promise to God. She's going to give Samuel to be a priest. But it's extreme, guys. How many, and I was thinking about how many times have I made vows to the Lord? You know, like, God, just get me out of this and I will blank, 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 right? And then when God does get you out of it and God calls us up to say, okay, I, I held my part of the deal. Remember what you promised me? And I fall short, right? Be careful the vows that you make to the Lord. Be careful the vows that you make to the Lord. If you're going to make a promise to the Lord, the Lord might call you up and say, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll honor that, but I want you to be integral yourself and honor your vow. It's really important. And what Hannah did was something extreme, radical, because even her husband, Elkanah, when, when, when she's like, he's going to Shiloh to worship, he's like, well, I, I got to stay back with the baby and wean this baby and get this baby ready. Because this baby, when I do go to the temple, I have intentions of leaving that child behind. And Elkanah says something really unusual to him, and, and, she's, and he's kind of like, really, you can hear in his voice, like, wait a minute. He's like, okay, you do whatever you wish to do, or whatever you think is best to do, 
but make sure they're established by the word of God. It's literally Elkanah saying, this is an extreme measure. But Hannah was willing to follow through with her vow. And we see because of that, because God prepped her to have the character to follow through with her promise, that when she followed through with that promise, God honored that. God honored it in an extraordinary way, and I believe that that's true for us today. When we make vows to the Lord, like, God, I want to, you know, I want to serve you, Lord. I want, I want to honor you because you've, been, you've done so much for me. And we're willing to carry that out in our lives. God will honor that in an extraordinary way. Because what happens is Samuel becomes one of the greatest prophets of old. And through the seeds of influence of his mother depositing them into his life at a very young age, he became a man of integrity that shifted the, nature, the, the nation and the culture back to God. Because the word says that in Samuel's time, the word of the Lord was rare. It means that culture was pushing away from God at extraordinary rates, extremely fast. But when Samuel grew up and he stepped into that place of being a prophet to the nations, he brought the nation back to the Lord. And that was through the influence of his mom. That's the first. The second person that I want to share with you is Jochebed. Now, do you guys know who Jochebed is? Or Jochebed? I don't know exactly how you would say it in the Jewish language, but Jochebed would have been Moses' mother. Exodus um, 6 talks about who Moses' mo mom was by name, Jochebed. And at her time... She, she came, let me, let me back up. Before her time, we know that the, the, her people, the Israelites, were carried off into exile to Egypt, right? For 400 years, they've been in exile. They haven't been living in their own land, and they've been held in bondage by the Egyptians and by Pharaoh. And all of a sudden, we hear this story come about where Pharaoh makes this edict, he makes this ruling among his nations where he sees that the Israelites' people are flourishing and growing and, and the nation is starting to exceed the, the Egyptians and he's worried about them maybe taking power over the Egyptian people. So he makes an edict to say, look, we're going to do is we're going we're gonna to create genocide. We're going to kill all the firstborn sons and we'll throw them in the Nile River. So he does that, Right? And all of a sudden, the story shifts. Now, I'm going to just, actually, I can go into something, but I'm not going to for sake of time. But, so when that happens, and he makes that edict, all of a sudden, the story shifts to a family. And that family was Jacobet and her husband, and they have a child, and they, the word of God says that child was unique or beautiful, and they recognized it. They realized that there was a calling on that child's life, and they were called to protect that life. And I believe today, for, for us today, in our culture today, it's the same thing. We have an edict in our nation that deals with abortion and all sorts of things. And we, as the people of God, have a calling on our lives to preserve life. To be a voice for those that don't have a voice. Right? Amen? I believe it. And we, need to, and we need to speak up for those. We need to exercise that when we vote this year. We need to vote for those that are pro-life. That is one way to have a voice for those that don't have a voice. It is our responsibility, and someday we'll stand before the Lord, and we will pay an account. It's that important. And the Word of God declares that over and over again. But we see Jacobet and she says, look, I have to preserve this life. This life has been preserved to me or has been given to me, has been granted me, entrusted to me. 
and I need to do my part to preserve and to protect this young child. So she does, and she hides them away for three months, but in the course of three months, they realize they're going to be found out. So what Jacobed decides to do is she decides to build an ark. And the word is ark for a reason. It doesn't say a boat. It doesn't say a raft. It says an ark. Because she wanted to embed her child. Now, ark is also another word for covenant or even testament. And what, God, what Jacob had wanted to do through the word of God is to surround her child by the promise of God. She was placing her child in the promises of God. And saying, you know what, God, I cannot, I I don't have the resources to protect my child anymore, but you do. And I am going to place him in this ark, and I am going to surrender this child into your hands. I entrust him to you. And I believe in faith, because in Hebrews 11, it says, Jacobed moved and was motivated by faith. It wasn't fear that she put that child in the ark. It was faith. She wasn't like, oh, the king's going to find us out and we're going to get beheaded or Pharaoh. It was, this is the very best thing to do to preserve this child's life. She puts him in the ark. She sets him into the Nile amongst the reeds. And the story unfolds of God's redemption. When she put Moses into God's covenant, into his covering, into his word, into his promises. There was a covering on that child's life that started to birth the story of redemption for his people. And the same is true for us. It is important for us to embed our children in the word of God. It's important to remind them who they are, who they belong to, the promises of God that have been spoken over them so that when they grow up, they, are, they have that embedded in their mind and they won't depart from it. Amen? I remember as a child, I can, I can tell you this, I remember as a child going into college and getting independence and, and then all of a sudden getting shifted into this, this idea of, of living in the world and I would go out and I would party and I'd do all these things and I'd have a, the time of my life but I would come home at night and I'm sure my roommates thought I was crazy and I'd get on my knees and pray. <laughs> it, was, it was a very conflicting life. But I remember every night because my mom taught me that that's what we do as children of God. We talk to God. We bring before him our day. We talk to him. We ask for forgiveness. We look to him for our provision for the next day. So every night I would pray, I'd kneel on my bed and, and I would pray every night. And over a, a course of, 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 of things that happened, God started to, to really cause me to, to have a place where I had to choose one or the other. But thank God for the seeds of influence that she, she deposited in my life that it helped me to choose right. Amen? And yet Jacob had did the same thing. She did that same thing for Moses. Jacobed did the very the hardest thing she possibly could do. She entrusted Moses into the hands of the Lord. But the amazing thing is, is this, guys. This is really, really cool. Is when she entrusted her child into the hands of the Lord and she put him in that ark, not only... Did she not lose a child? She gained the child back. Because the word says that when Pharaoh's daughter found this child and spared his life and took took him in as her own, she needed to find a woman that would nurse this child and raise this child. So she named him Moses, which means drawn from the water, drawn out of the Nile. But in the Egyptian language, that meant drawn out of the water. In the Hebrew language, it meant son. And she received, all of a sudden, she hired Jacobed to raise this child for her to be um, his nanny 
and she was even paid for it. So she received back what she lent to the Lord. And the same is true with us. When we, give our, when we place our children in the, in, in the hands of the Lord, not only does God use them, but he also brings them back to us in, 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 a, in a fuller capacity, so to speak, I guess. Not only as our child, but now a child of destiny. Amen? And then the last example is this, and we're going to close, and I'll get to my point. <laughs> it's been a long way to get to my point, but we'll get to it. <laughs> Lois and, um, Lois and, and uh, Eunice. So y- Lois and, and Eunice were, um, Lois was a grandmother, and Eunice was the mother of Timothy. And let me read to you this out of Acts 16. He says, now this is, this is Paul's second missions trip. They're getting ready to go on to another missions trip. There's a division between some of the disciples and the apostles over John Mark because John deserted them the first trip and all of a sudden they're like, okay, who's going to take John Mark? And um, Barnabas says, I want to take John Mark. Like, he's ready now. He's learned his lesson. He's ready to share the gospel. And Paul's like, no way. I want nothing to do with John Mark. So they split ways. Barnabas takes John Mark, and they go and do missions. And Paul takes Silas. Well, Paul and Silas go to to Derby and Lystra. And when they go to Derby and Lystra, in Acts 16, it says this. Then they came to Derby and Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple was there named Timothy, a, a son of a certain Jewish woman who believed but his father was a Greek. He was well spoken of by the brethren who were in Lystra and Iconium. Paul wanted to have him go with him, and he took him. Now, let me, let me stop there for a minute. Now, I can, I've, I've read that I don't know how many times, and I think, oh, that's so cool. You know, like, hey, Paul just, got, Paul just invited Timothy to go on a missions trip with him, how great of an honor would it be to be doing missions with the Apostle Paul, right? But let's go back in time for a moment. Think about this just for a minute as a parent. Now, here's, here's his mom and grandmother and Timothy. They come into their region. They're preaching the word of God. And Paul says he recognizes something unique in Timothy. And we'll talk about where, where that came from in a minute. But, Tim, but Paul says, I want to take Timothy with us. So, so Timothy goes with Paul and Silas on this missions trip all through Asia. But one thing that we could miss in the moment is this, that who was Paul at that time? He was the apostle Paul, but he was being hunted. He was a wanted man, right? He was on the America's most wanted list in the Jewish region, right? Right? All the time he had to be running for his life, there'd be people that he would be, be in stripes, in prison, beaten, all sorts of different things were happening. It was a dangerous occupation. As of this point, almost, the, the rating of martyrdom to the apostles was a 90-some percent rating that you are going to die for your faith. Imagine the faith of Lois and Eunice, when Paul says, by the way, can we take your son with us? We'll take real good care of him. (laughs) Right? It must have took monumental faith of of Lois and Eunice to say, to be rejoicing in the moment to say, you know what? That's awesome. I knew God had a a, a calling on this young child's life since, since his birth or since being a young child. And what a privilege that he can serve the Lord Jesus Christ, in this this mission field with Paul and Silas. I mean, think about that for a minute. Wow, right? So later on in 2 Timothy, Paul sends a letter to Timothy. Now, Timothy now has been left behind in Ephesus to become a young pastor in Ephesus, the leading pastor of the church in Ephesus, and Paul writes this letter before he's about to, to, to give his life 
uh, for his faith. And he writes this. He says, When I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you, which dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, I am persuaded it is also in you. That is a massive compliment. Paul is saying, you know what? When I came to Lystris and I saw and I met your grandmother and your your mother and I interacted with them, I saw the faith of God in their lives and it was so unusual. And when I even asked them if they would allow you to come with me and to serve with me, they rejoiced in it. I saw the faith of a mother and I knew that that would play, play out in your life. And later in life, he saw Timothy's faith. And he says, you know what? That same faith that I saw in your mom and grandmother, now I see in you too. What seeds of influence, right? Powerful. Moms, congratulations. You guys are amazing. You have a massive calling on your lives. What you're doing now is influencing the future generations. When I was reading Psalms this week, and I was reading about uh, David, he was writing the Psalms, and he, was, and he was pleading with the Lord, Lord, let me just remain a little longer that I can influence the next generations so that they can, they can, they can offer up praises unto your name. David didn't want to stay on this earth just to inhabit the earth a little longer for just... To, for, for ease or comfort or any of those things. He knew he had a calling to impart onto the next generations who God is and how he wants to use the next generation and people to play a part in his kingdom. Amen? And, and moms, you play a huge part in that. So let me tell you this. As I was praying about it, and I'm like, Lord, how do I, how do I nail this down? So we're just going to get to the, to, to the brunt of it, is, is this. There's a sem- central hub to this wheel of parenting. And it's really, truly, it's a truth that can apply anywhere in our lives. But it applies in parenting, too. And I really was praying about this last night. And, I was, and the Lord spoke something to me that I've been working on for a while in my heart. But I really didn't have words to put it, um, to be able to communicate it well. So first, first is this. Don't get so caught up in everything you do or say. Your kids will not remember everything that you say and teach them, but they will remember how you lived your life. Let me repeat that one more time. Your kids might not remember everything that you say or teach them, maybe not everything you even do for them, but they will remember how you lived your life. I can't tell you everything my mom ever taught me. I can't tell you everything she ever told me, but I can tell you one thing, she loved Jesus. I can say the same thing about my grandmother, and because of their faith, it left an impression on my heart. So moms, live your life with faith and know that that life is leaving a mark on future generations. So this is the key. How do we live that life? There was a gentleman that said to me about six months ago something that just resounded in my heart. And I was like, ah. And I forgot what he said. I knew what he said, but I forgot what he said. And so for like the last week, I've been begging the Lord to bring this back into my into my into my memory, into my conscience. I'm like, Lord, I remember that that moment when you gave to me. I I need that. And it wasn't even for this message. I just wanted it for me. And it was when my father had a heart attack and we were in the hospital. We went up to Gates Vascular. That was the night he got flown up. And We get to the front desk, and there's a guy working at the front desk, and he was a brother in the Lord. And, you know, we're just kind of telling him, like, hey, my father-in-law just had a heart attack. We want to get up there and see him and pray for him and and all of those things. And he said something to me that just resounded in my spirit. And I knew it was a word from the Holy Spirit. He says, 
What you put in the hands of God, what you put in the hands of God, you will see the glory of God. The things that you put in the hands of God, them things you will see the glory of God. And think about these stories for a minute. Every single one of them, there was a time in these mothers' lives or even a parent's life, if you're not a mom, where they had to put their children in the hands of the Lord to see the glory of the Lord. So often, sometimes our culture teaches us that we have to be like so much in control of our children's lives and decisions and all of these things, and we're trying to, to, to get into it and, and cause it to channel to the very best we know how. And that's not always wrong, but that's not always right either. I heard Lisa Bevere say, I was watching something once, and it kind of goes with the same thing. She says, one of the greatest callings on a parent's life, and I think she was talking about moms, I'm not certain where she was, but it just caught my attention, is to raise our primary responsibilities to raise our children to be independent of, our, independent of us and dependent upon God. So often we raise our kids, we want them to be dependent upon us and independent upon everything else because it gives us control. But we have to learn that that is not our greatest calling. Our greatest calling is to raise them up to be independent of this world and even of us at times, but to be totally dependent upon God. And let me give you an example of this Haley was going through something this week a little bit, um, and uh, she, she texts me, and she's like, hey, you know, like, what do you think, Dad? What do you think I should do on this situation? So I'm, I'm typing her, and I'm like, hey, you know, this is, the, you know, this and that, and the Lord says, no, erase it, and I erased it, and, I, and, and the Lord is like, you need her to depend upon the Holy Spirit within her. And he, he go, if she just continues to lean on your faith and not lean on her own faith, you're not helping her in the situation. So I said, you know what, Haley? I trust the God that is in you, that can lead you. You pray, and the Lord will lead. That's what we do at times. Because all of a sudden, we're giving them a confidence to know that the same God that is working in us is also working in them. So I feel like that's a call just not only into my, my own life, but also into your guys' life, that sometimes we just have to let go. Sometimes we've been striving and struggling, and we have kids that are, you know, maybe walking the prodigal life, or kids that are growing up that really haven't come back yet, or sick kids, or, you know, whatever, the, whatever it may be, and we're just... One of the greatest things we can do, but one of the hardest things we can do is release them to the Lord. I remember before I went into ministry on my knees one day, and the Lord says, you need to release your children to me. And I remember, and I wasn't putting my child in the Nile River, and I wasn't sending them to a faraway town to work in the ministry, but it was a, literally a heart condition, and I laid on the floor weeping, and saying, God, like, anything but that. And he wouldn't budge. Anything but that, Lord. I'll give you anything but that. And he just wouldn't budge. And finally, I was just like, okay, God, they're yours. The, 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 the most precious thing that I have in my life is yours because I trust you. And you know what? The cool thing is, is when I put them in, in the hands of the Lord, I've seen God move more powerfully than ever if they were ever in my hands. So I just encourage you guys as parents and as mothers, you guys are doing a great job, but one of the greatest jobs you can do is teach your kids to be dependent upon their faith. Amen?